All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. The discussion today is about vitamin D once more. There is one more study from Spain that is very interesting. And <laughs> interestingly, people have been leaving links from other YouTubers who have been talking about it. So, <laughs> excuse me. So I think it is important for us to talk about it as well. And we will do our talk in that general way where we actually dig deeper and understand the mechanisms. So hang out with me. What we'll do is this. We'll talk about the study. <clears throat> then we'll look at the way vitamin D helps the mechanisms. Then we'll look at the normal ranges, the blood range of the vitamin D. And finally, we'll look at the what dose of vitamin D should be taken and why should it be taken with calcium and vitamin K2. So hang in there and let's start. And once again, welcome. So here is drbean.com and here is the study. <clears throat> so the study is um, from Spain. And what it says is effect of calcifidiol, or this is the uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, or this is also the first form of inactive vitamin D in our body. We'll look in, into that in a second. So the treatment and best available therapy versus best available therapy in an intensive care unit admission and mortality. So this is coming out of the um, Spain. So if you look at it, this is a parallel pilot randomized open label. So they knew what they were giving, double masked or double blind clinical trial. Setting is Reina Sofia University Hospital, Cordoba, Spain. Participants were 76. So let's talk about this study and then we'll talk about the vitamin D as well. So my request to you is this, that please share this with others because what I have done is, as you can see, I have packaged the whole vitamin D related material in this one uh, video. So you'll have everything in it from the mechanism of action, from the dosage, from the blood levels, from the reasons for deficiency and who should be more careful, for example, obese folks or the folks of color. So uh, please do me a favor and share this. Let's start. <clears throat> so here's the study. Study is done in Reina Sofia University from Spain, parallel pilot randomized open label double blind. Good. So it is not exactly placebo controlled, and that is fine. So what they did was they took 76 participants. They were consecutive patients. That means they were present together. They were all hospitalized. So that means, interestingly, this was a study in the hospitalized patient and not before the hospitalization or at home or during the prophylaxis. And here I would like to say this that what I saw in, uh, for example, the Zelenko protocol, which I love, that um, uh, did not have vitamin D in it. I believe uh, Math Plus also somehow, I feel it misses on vitamin D as well. Vitamin D, we have been talking about it for about four months now. Vitamin D is crucial and it is important to take. And I think our videos, we have two or three videos already out there for vitamin D and they, they have had very good views as well. So back here, uh, by, for me, views is importance is that more people had the message. I have never tried to be sales many and try to, you know, just try to spread it. I think it is important message. It should go to as many people as possible because it is life saving with over the counter available um, things. So they were all, the patients were all in acute respiratory infection. So there is a question, uh, Julie says that, is D3 okay? Of course, D3 is okay as well. However, of course, the uh, calcifidiol is better because it is uh, it doesn't need to be converted by liver. <clears throat> but that also means that it is not available over the counter in every country. And these patients were PCR positive. That means they were confirmed cases. Plus their CURB score was greater than one. That means they were serious enough to be in the hospital. Now, in the procedure, what they did was they took 50 patients in one group. 
and they took 26 patient in another. So almost two to one ratio. The 50 patients were the one that were going to receive vitamin D high dose and 26 patients were the one who were not going to receive vitamin D, but they both received the standard best care that hospital could offer. So let's look at what was the best care that hospital could offer. And we are talking about hospitalized patients. I think that Cool Beans over here may have a comment here about what they were giving them. They were giving them hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So hospitalized patient, what do you think about hydroxychloroquine? So 400 milligram BD, that means 800 milligram the first day, then 400 milligram in two divided doses for the remaining five days. Right? And then azithromycin, 500 milligram for five days. So good regime. Again, uh, patients were hospitalized. For hospitalized patients, I believe that hydroxy alone is... Um, is not as effective. So zinc, quercetin, vitamin D, as they did in this study, and melatonin, ascorbic acid, aspirin, these are the things that are also needed. So <clears throat> for me, it seems like this was, uh, this, this regime was not the best, but anyways, for that hospital, this was the best that they were offering. And so who am I? This is what they were offering. In addition to that, what they did was to these 50 patients, they gave them calcidiol. Calcidiol is, and we'll talk about that in a second, but generally when you eat vitamin D, when you get the vitamin D from a supplement or from food or from skin, that is the first stage of vitamin D or inactive vitamin D. Then it goes to liver and it becomes pre-hormone or one step before the active form. So what they did was they administered this one step before the active form. So they did not need the liver to become involved in um, metabolizing the first stage. So that is good actually. It's uh, people who cannot absorb vitamin D3 successfully, they are usually given calcifidiol. So I'll explain that in the next uh, screen. So here, this is what they were given. These are the name for the same thing. So calcifidiol or calcidiol or 25 hydroxy coal calciferol or 25 hydroxy vitamin D. They are all the same things. So now let's see what was the dose. The dose was 0 0.532 milligram on day one and then 0 0.26 milligram day three and seven and then weekly after. So at the end of the discussion, I'm going to convert those milligrams to the international units as well. So it, they are about, so this is about 21,000 international units. And this is of course about half of it. So 10,000 international units. So down here, this was the dosage regime. This is what they had done. So when the patient came in the very first day when they started this regime, the very first day of hydroxychloroquine, 400 milligram BD, then 200 milligram BD for the next five days. That was hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, 500 milligram for five days. And then this uh, calcifidiol, that was 0 0.532 milligram the first day. And then on third day and seventh day, 0 0.266, almost half of it. And then weekly after that. And uh, here, what is missing is, of course, and I'm okay with this because this is a short time um, administration. If this was long time, then I would have said that calcium should be there, vitamin K2 should be there, magnesium le levels should be seen, and so on. But this was a short time of administration. The outcomes that they were measuring was rate of ICU admission or death. In the paper, they say and death. And I replace it with or because I don't understand what does ICU admission and death mean. Uh, I think it is either the patient went to ICU, at ICU or in the ICU they died as well. So I have replaced this and with or. Now results, look at the results. Results were patients, there were 50 patients who were on, on <coughs> I'm so sorry. So there was a gender reveal party over here and somebody, uh, they did that and they started another fire. 
So the valley is so full of smoke that it's just crazy. So um, 50 patients were on the um, vitamin D. And then out of them, look at this. Just one patient went to ICU out of 50. And none of the patients died. The ones who were receiving vitamin D in addition to the other uh, prescription. Now, the 26 patients who were receiving the similar prescription, but they were not receiving vitamin D. 13 patients, half of them ended up in the ICU and two of them from ICU died as well. Can you see what a drastic difference? And what was interesting for me was, if you see here, <clears throat> I looked at the data and I think you would appreciate this as well. Um, let's look at this. Poor prognosis factors. So this was the group that was receiving extra vitamin D. Greater than 60 years, 14 in the vitamin D group and five in the non-vitamin D group. So 28% and over there 19%. Even then, the results were better on the vitamin D group where there were more people who were in older stage. Previous lung disease, 8%, 8% equal. Previous diabetes, 6% and 19%. So the 19% of diabetes is actually a bigger issue on the non-vitamin D side. High blood pressure, hypertension, 24% here and 57% over there. So again, the other arm was actually more at risk. Previous cardiovascular disease equal. Immunocompromised, look at this, immunocompromised, 12% on this side and 3% on the other side. At least one prognostic feature, 48%, 61%, so slightly heavy on the non-vitamin D and so on. So for, for me, this was important. This was important. Age, greater than 60%, 28% people here and 19% over there. So that, that was an interesting data point. So this is the study. What is the takeaway from here? The takeaway is that the high dose vitamin D and especially the second stage of the vitamin D can really significantly change the risk factor for the patients. So this is it. This is where we finish. They say in their study, they say that, hey, we are looking for, this is a pilot study. We just did a small study. We have proved something. Uh, now we would like more studies to be done. <clears throat> People had um, sent me the videos from Dr. John Campbell, where he had said that I would like that WHO and other administrations, they should recommend trials. I actually think that vitamin D is such a harmless substance. And of course, one has to look at the patient's uh, body habitus, their, their situation, that this should be a standard administration, standard drug to all administrations of the COVID-19. This is vitamin D we're talking about. This is not a controlled substance. This is not remdesivir that we do not know how would it act. Vitamin D should be just generally added and we should all use it as well. So I have been, I know, I think you know that I've, I've been a proponent of using vitamin D, uh, vitamin K2, calcium for a long time. So please make sure that you are taking vitamin D. Again, make sure that it causes calcium level changes, phosphate level changes, magnesium level changes. It causes calcification of blood vessels. If you are hypertensive, it can cause an issue. If you have a cardiovascular disease and you are taking calcium channel blockers or you, you have a problem with the heart, with arrhythmias, this can become an issue. So talk with your doctor if you have any comorbidities. But if you don't, then it is important to keep your vitamin D levels correct. So please do it. Right, so now if we look at it, just for the completion's sake, <clears throat> let's look at how vitamin D works. So vitamin D can either be synthesized in our skin or it can be taken as supplement or it can be found in the food sources all, as well. All the food sources are usually poor in vitamin D unless they are fortified. 
So uh, also, please remember the toxic dose. Vitamin D is, is a um, fat soluble vitamin. And to remember them, ADIC, the cat is on the ADIC is how we used to remember. And ADIC is A, D, E, and K. So these are the ones that are fat soluble. Toxic dose observed is after 40,000 international units daily use for more than 12 weeks. So um, for a few days, if somebody has taken 4,000 units, international units or 5,000, it doesn't really cause a big issue. So here are the three sources. Number one, sun. So when the ultraviolet B rays, they fall on our skin, they convert the seven hydroxy cholesterol to cholecalciferol. So that is one way. And for this one, please remember, the sun has to be at an angle that the ultraviolet B rays can pass the ozone layer and come down to us. So it is usually, if, you're, if your shadow is shorter than you, then the sun is probably at the correct angle to cause UVB rays to come to you. If your shadow is longer than you, that means early in the morning or later in the day, then UVB rays normally bounce off of the ozone and do not come down to us. So uh, this is one sunlight. Secondly is the supplements. Of course, we know about that. Food. <clears throat> In the food, fatty fish or fatty fish liver oils are the ones that are rich in vitamin D. Fortified foods, for example, milk are also, or cereals, they have vitamin D as well. Mushrooms that are exposed to ultraviolet B rays, they have vitamin D as well. Beef and egg yolk have vitamin D, but they are poor sources of vitamin D. Now what happens is, once we have the cholecalciferol, either from the sun or the supplement or the um, food, then it goes to liver. And in the liver, it is converted to er ergocalciferol, depending upon the source, or calcifidiol. That is what they were used using in the study. Now the question is, why did they use this? and not cholecalciferol. What they did was by using calcifidiol or 25 hydroxy vitamin D, they were able to bypass the liver's function. So liver function was not a problem or the absorption was not a problem. What happens is what, what we know, and I have some other studies to show you, this 25 hydroxy D is 100% more easier to absorb from intestine as compared to vitamin D3 or the native vitamin D. That is one. Secondly, when we give 25 hydroxy D, so let's say if there is a chart here and you give native vitamin D, that is vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, then <clears throat> it reaches a plateau level even when you increase the dose. So at certain dose, it does not increase the serum levels even more. However, the, the calcifidiol, when you administer that, it almost has a dose-dependent linear relationship. So as you continue to increase the dose, the absorption is 100% more than the, uh, the native form. And so the uh, serum levels increase linearly. So in general, the takeaway is it is actually better to take this if possible compared to native one. But if native is not, if this is not available and the prescription is not there, then take native. Now this 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is hydroxylated here, is then further hydroxylated in kidney. And in the kidney, there is another hydroxylating enzyme, which then puts one more hydroxy onto this. And this becomes 125. So now there are two places on vitamin D, place number one and 25, where hydroxy units are now attached. So 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, this is the active form. This is the active form. So what they did was they gave the intermediate form. This is also called pre-hormone. It is one stage before the active form. It needs the kidney to be functioning correctly. Those folks who do not have a correctly functioning kidney, they may have a problem converting here. So in that case, they would need this form. But Otherwise, this form is actually better than cholecalciferol. Good. Now, <clears throat> functions of vitamin D. 
and because we have done like three videos and i have done a video called can vitamin d help fight covid-19 and it's about an hour long video where we discussed in detail the mechanisms i'm not going to go in detail again but i want us to kind of review what are the mechanisms what are the ways that vitamin d helps us so let's look at them we all know that vitamin d's primary role that we know it for is calcium magnesium and phosphate level maintenance in our body so that also helps maintain the uh, calcium levels in the bone and so the bone density and bone strength is also something that is managed by vitamin d so we all know that how vitamin d works is this vitamin d the active form that is 125 dihydroxy vitamin d it enters the the cell it goes into the cell nucleus where there is vitamin d receptor it attaches to that receptor these are called vdr vitamin d receptors and then that receptor and vitamin d complex attaches with the genes um, various genes in the nucleus and those genes then get converted to messenger rnas those rnas would then make proteins that would do the function so this is how the vitamin d actually causes the uh, functions so there is a comment here is youtube still pulling the videos down yes so they continue to pull the videos down or they demonetize it and then we put the request in sometimes they put it back sometimes they don't um but they have uh, for sure reduced the exposure of our videos for example if my videos used to be watched uh, 10 million minutes every month now they are watched 5 million minutes so youtube just does not um does not suggest it as many time so i think once they understand that okay this is the channel i'm not going to like then they just reduce the exposure of the channel anyways we'll continue to work so here epithelial so second function which is really important for um, for the covid-19 and for other respiratory viruses as well and diseases as well that is the epithelial barrier maintenance so imagine this is the airway so i have what i've done is i've taken a part of our airway so let's say this is the airway right so i've taken one part and then i have expanded it the cells here the epithelial cells they are fused with each other they are tightly bound to each other so if these are if you look at my hands if these are two cells when they come in contact they make tight junctions with each other so things cannot slip between them and go in vitamin d has an important role to maintain these tight junctions so there are proteins that bind the cells together to maintain the tight junctions these proteins the gene to make these proteins are up regulated by vitamin d so vitamin d helps make the genes that would help make the helps open the genes that would help make the proteins that cause the epithelial cells to stick to each other and be a team and not allow the virus to penetrate through the junctions and go deeper so vitamin d would help make the epithelial junction stronger very good function and very important function then in the kidney what it does is it reduces the renin angiotensin system's function so angiotensin 2 conversion is eventually reduced so it, it suppresses the renin angiotensin 2 system and you know that renin angiotensin system we've talked about it in the past would eventually create angiotensin 2 and then ace2 enzyme was needed to convert the angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1 to 7 I have done these discussion in two videos called hypercoagulability with um, COVID-19. So if if you wanted to see the mechanism, please see it over there. The end result is that angiotensin II is more, which causes more inflammation, which causes hypercoagulability, which causes severe severe issues. Vitamin D reduces the activity activity of renin angiotensin system again by genetic modulation of the cells. and the result is that the inflammation the severe inflammation is reduced again it's a small study but look out of 50 patients just one patient went to the icu and even him or her got discharged and out of the 26 patients who were receiving the same exact 
drugs except vitamin D, 13 ended up in ICU and two died. So renin angiotensin system modulation is very, very important. Then enables autophagy of the infected cell. This is very, very important. This is also some, something where ivermectin works in. Remember that with ivermectin, we had this discussion that the virus sends its cargo into the nucleus and causes the nucleus to not be able to defend itself. What was the defense mechanism? There were two defense mechanisms. Number one, the cell infected cell will produce interferon gamma, which will cause the nearby cells to become stronger. Secondly, the infected cell would try to kill itself. So in certain cases, what happens is here is the virus. Virus is going to increase the protein. This is coronavirus. It increases a protein called SKP2, which in turn inhibits a protein called Becl Beclin-1. Beclin-1 is responsible to tell the cell to kill itself, to cause a suicide because you're infected, you're not going to survive. So before the virus replicates in you and use, use your resources a lot, just kill yourself. But the virus already blocks it. This is where the ivermectin comes in and says, okay, virus, you cannot do that. And the cell would still be able to defend itself. This is where vitamin D comes in as well. Guys, vitamin D can actually then work like ivermectin. Vi vitamin D comes in and what it does is it produces a protein called clothoprotein. Clothoprotein in turn causes, in turn causes Beclin one's production, which causes the cell to kill itself. So virally infected cell very quickly kills itself and the virus doesn't have the resources available to continue to multiply. And vitamin D helps with that. Can you imagine this? Ivermectin's function is here. Hydroxychloroquine's function of immune modulation is here. Many of the immune systems functions you would see are also going to be modulated here. Vitamin D should be eaten all the time. Again, keeping in mind your health keeping in mind your calcium levels, your cardiac level, your hypertension level, your kidneys levels, your liver uh, functions, but maintain your vitamin D levels. You would enjoy your life. You would, at least at this time, you'll be much more protected than those who are vitamin D deficient. And please, I beg you, share this video with others. I have never asked to share other than at the end of every video, but I think this is an important topic. So here, <clears throat> Vitamin D also reduces the release of cytokines and chemokines. And here for the immune system, I have only made one cell as a representation of the immune system. These are the cytokines and chemokines that are released and they are released by many different kinds of cells within the immune system. For example, interferon alpha and gamma, interferon alpha is released by macrophages, interferon gamma are released by cytotoxic T cells and T helper one cells, interleukin one, interleukin six interle are released by macrophages and dendritic cells, interleukin 12 are released by uh, macrophages and so on. Tumor necrosis factor macrophages, chemokines, remember this is where the RANTES and the lirolimab comes in, check this out. Vitamin D reduces the release of all of them. What else do we want? It reduces the, the release of all of them. And that results in a more calm immune system. We go for lirolimab or we go for remdesivir or we go for steroids. Here we have vitamin D that can help us be better. Okay, continuing on. So immune system modulation, very important. Then vitamin D increases production of cathelicidins. And I have done that discussion in the past as well. Cathelicidins are usually released by the immune system cells. These proteins are called also defensins. They would cause holes and punctures in the target pathogen and cause it to burst open and die. And vitamin D helps open up the genes that help produce defensins and cathelicidins. Important one. Of course, so there is a question, what about RANTES? Same thing here. So we are talking about this C, this C3 and 5. That is the RANTES side. So it actually modulates, down modulates the RANTES as well. 
it down modulates the chemokines. And yesterday's discussion, we talked about the chemokines in the inflammation that that causes the white blood cells to come to the site of infection. Lironlimab, for example, blocks that, or at least in theory, in mechanism does that. Here, vitamin D does that too. For a short period of time, people may have to take uh, higher doses. I take at least 5,000 international units on a daily basis. I take calcium with that, and I take vitamin K2 with that. So back here, increase production of catholicin. And increase production of surfactant. Surfactant is the fluid in our alveoli that keeps them open. And vitamin D helps open up the genes that produce surfactant in the type 2 pneumocytes. Beautiful mechanism. So not only it is helping the barrier function, not only it is modulating the immune system, not only it is keeping the inflammation low, it is also helping to keep the lungs open. Love it. Reduces tissue factor production. Now, this is on the hypercoagulability. I should have said over here, hypercoagulability prevention or reduction. So under this one, it reduces the tissue factor production. What is tissue factor? When some tissue cell gets broken down, it produces tissue factor, which is a breakdown product. And that tissue factor in turn causes the production of thrombi. If, if the damage is to the blood vessel, again, hypercoagulability, I've done that discussion. Vitamin D works on the genes that produce tissue factors and reduces them. Love it. Increases antithrombin and thrombomodulins. Increases the gene expression that causes the production of antithrombin and thrombomodulin, which reduce the thromb thrombus formation. So imagine if it is given with aspirin-like thing. This is beautiful. <clears throat> now, talking about, and by the way, let me just very quickly show you all of this over here. So this was the discussion we've already looked at. Here is the uh, another study that says vitamin D receptor stimulation to reduce acute respiratory distress syndrome in patients with coronavirus infections. Revise, revise on this thing. So over here, all those mechanisms that I described, they have those mechanisms in detail as well. And somebody had asked me the question about Rantes. Can you see here? So all of them. And I have these links in the description as well. I have been working hard for cool beans. So here, if you see, if I scroll down, all those mechanisms are mentioned here as well. It's just that I elaborated them too. So here, uh, function with the rentes. Here, the function with the uh, epithelial barrier. Here is the renin angiotensin system modulation. Here is the SKP, SK, SKP2 protein modulation and neutrophil modulation. Here, the other cells with the um, pneumocyte and producing surfactants, defensine and catholicidines. So I have actually, and then coagulation with the tissue factors and thrombin and thrombomodulin. My, my point is that all of this is written here. This is not Mubin just bringing up something out of the air and, and saying, here is something that you should just trust. We have evidence here, and this study in turn, whenever they made a point, they further refer to the study from where that point is coming. So everything here is evidence-based. Okay, so now let's look at the deficiency. Worldwide, 7% of the people have severe deficiency, 7% of 7 billion people. That's a lot of people. 40 percent, almost half of the world's population is deficient in vitamin D. 65 percent in India are deficient. 42 percent Americans are deficient. And please now remember, I am here in America, so I would talk more in detail for America. 42% in America that are deficient are not uniformly deficient, meaning it's not that you have any 4,200 people in a room and 42 are deficient. Old age folks are more deficient compared to youngsters. Women are postmenopausal women are more deficient compared to premenopausal women. People who are in the in the 
poverty stratum who are in the lower uh, income class, they are more deficient because of malabsorption and malnutrition. So it is not that we have a uniform distribution of 40% um, uh, deficiency. For example, in African Americans, 82% of their adults are deficient. That is terrible. Hispanic, 62% of Hispanics are deficient. Just correcting this much can be a game changer for, for the US. Then you know that 40% of the Americans are obese and 18% of American children are obese. And obese folks, majority of them are vitamin D deficient. And I want to talk about that. Please do me a favor. I would request you. I've never begged you for this. Please share it. Because this has to go to people in the US at least. Look, <clears throat> poor nutrition in the US, obesity. And why does obesity cause vitamin D deficiency? And I have the um, study here as well. Um, prevalence of vitamin D deficiency associated risk factors. And then I believe here, vitamin D deficiency consequences or cause of obesity. So in this study, they have talked about vitamin D deficiency can cause obesity and obesity can cause vitamin D deficiency. So they are both, uh, up, they, this is a vicious cycle. Once it starts, it just keeps going. So here, let's look at it, obesity. Number one, it is possible that in the obese folks, the liver has become fatty and does not work very well. And you saw that the liver is important in converting the coal calciferol to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. That first hydroxylation is done there. So if the liver has a problem, then we have a problem. And obese folks sometimes have fatty liver, actually many times, and that would reduce the conversion of or metabolism of vitamin D. That's one. Then obese folks, of course, have a larger volume of tissue. So vitamin D will have to, even if you give them the same units, this would have to now be distributed in a larger volume. And so in the study, they said that they observed that almost 30% lower response is observed when given the same doses of vitamin D to obese folks as compared to normal folks. What that means is that obese folks will have to increase their vitamin D level based on their body volume. Number two. Number three, adipose tissue, the fat tissues stores vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin it is stored in in fats so vitamin d is stored in fat so if one has more fat tissue or adipose tissue more vitamin d is going to go and get stored there then not only it is stored there the fat tissue is our enemy not only it stores it there it breaks it down and destroys it so meta the fat tissue adipose tissue metabolizes the vitamin d and makes it useless So these are the factors that would cause the deficiency of vitamin D in obese folks. In America, I'll once again say 39 point some percent of obese adults are obese. 18 point something of the children are obese. So they are already at risk of severe situation. And this can be corrected. Greater than 65 years of age, folks are usually deficient in vitamin D for two reasons. One. They, they do not go out that much if they are in nursing homes or if they are more at home. Secondly, the absorption from the intestine starts reducing. Reduction in sunlight. So there are many areas in the US that have less sunlight and or the right angle of the sun is not available. African-Americans, as I said, 82% are deficient. Adults, 82% of African-Americans are deficient in vitamin D. Hispanic, 62% deficient. Now, <clears throat> last two topics, levels of vitamin D. So look, uh, there are varied opinions. Some people say 30 to 70 nanogram per milliliter are good levels. Others say 8 to 60 nanogram. Books say 
that lesser than 32 or 30 nanogram per milliliter is considered deficient. And if you are not in the US and you wanted to convert nanogram to milli, uh, milliliter to nanomole, which is used in the international labs, then use multiply the nanogram by 2. with 2.5. Dose, 1,000 international units is 25 microgram. Of course, 4,000 units, which is normally recommended nowadays, is 100 microgram. I give to my patients and myself 5,000 international units on a daily basis. And I think that is even on the lower side nowadays. If it is taken for a prolonged period of time, then there can be issues. There can be fat, uh, calcium deposition issues. So one has to use uh, vitamin K plus calcium plus has to regularly check. Plus a parathyroid function has to be seen. Renal function has to be seen. So I'm not saying to take more than 5,000 units for a very long time, but for a few months, we can probably work with it. Now this study, <coughs> excuse me, this study had administered 0 0.532 milligram the first day. That makes it 532 microgram. That makes it 21,000 international units on the first day. Then 0 0.26 milligram or 266 microgram or 10,500 international units on the day three, seven, and weekly after that till the patient had either uh, discharged or went to ICU. So this is the discussion for today. Um, my request to you once again is going to be please like, subscribe, and share. And please share this. Take this as your favor to other fellow human beings. We have been doing these discussions. It's now, I think, 150 videos that I've done. So I've done a lot of days. I've done your service. Today, I'm asking you for a help, and that is please share it with others. Um, so there's a question here. K2 activates, um, or a comment, proteins that keep calcium. Correct. So what happens is the function of K2 is that it activates the proteins that would help with the calcium metab me metabolism in the blood vessels and in the for, and for the coagulation proteins. When we give vitamin D, vitamin D upregulates the production of such proteins that work with calcium. However, if K2 is not present in the appropriate amounts, then those proteins will not function correctly, and the and the calcium would get deposited in the blood vessel walls, for example, and not be removed because these proteins that vitamin D has faithfully increased need vitamin K2 to be available as well to function. So you can say that vitamin D has brought in the cranes and tractors to function to remove calcium from the blood vessels, but the drivers of those proteins are vitamin K2. And if they are not there, these proteins are not going to work. So vitamin um, D has to be given in combination with calcium plus uh, vitamin K2. So the uh, <clears throat> Leanne says, how much K2 on a daily basis? So the on-label K2 is sufficient. So this is a question. Do you know Dr. Cicero Coimbra from Brazil? No, I do not. Um, <clears throat> The vitamin D study solidifies the benefit of this vitamin and steroids will save life to avoid bradycardia storm. Thank you, Dr. Bean. Absolutely. So, guys, for me, it is really this simple. Correct vitamin D, correct vitamin C, melatonin, um, steroids, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, azithromycin or doxycycline, and then steroids in the later stages. That's it. That is the, the golden recipe. So, and if you are someone who does not like to take supplements, you like to take foods, I have done a video called a food plate for strong immune system. Please look for that video. And I have talked about foods that have various vitamins and supplements in them. So with this, thank you very much. And welcome back after the weekend. Today is actually Labor Day. So uh, happy Labor Day to everyone. And I would see you tomorrow.